practices and implications. Uh, and we usually call such topics as downed pilot. Uh, why do I say so? Because at the moment when lawyers came to a clear understanding of what NFT is, uh, from a legal point of view, the market lost interest uh, in this instrument because uh, he lost trust, trust, which will be difficult to restore. Uh, they are tied to waiting for something, for, I mean, special regulation, uh, and they are constantly under the stress uh, of uh, introducing uh, restrictive measures um, that significantly con uh, constrains the market. Uh, in addition to the exciting lo logical problems with the use of digital objects. This is why Metaverse and Web3 are uh, off the radar of big companies now. Uh, however, today we will meet like an, a medical concilium over the body and see if it can be resisted, uh, resist, uh, resisted, resisted. Uh, finally, I promise you uh, at the end an inspiring topic about artificial intelligence, of course. But first, uh, let me introduce uh, uh, the first participant, participant of our um, uh, panel, the brilliant expert, Emily Good, assistant director of the Institute of Art and Law. Um, Emily Good is assistant director of the Institute of Art and Law. She writes, teaches, and presents on, on a range of areas uh, pertaining to art and cultural heritage law, including copyright, heritage crime, museums, ethics, and contracts. She teaches uh, on the art, business, and law LLM program at the Center of Commercial Law Studies in Queen's Mary University of London. And uh, he's a frequent contributor of the uh, institution of um, art and law blog. Uh, and uh, also, uh, Emily um, was uh, recently presented her position on the NFT at the meeting of the UK Committee on Digital Culture, Culture Media and Sports. Uh, so, uh, Thank you very much, Emily, for your participation. Thank you, Olga. Thank yeah. you. Very yeah. Thank you. Shall I go? Yes, yes, you can start. Thank you so much for the very kind introduction, Olga, and thank you for inviting me to participate in this really fascinating day. We've heard so much, I'm sure all our brains are buzzing. Um, so now we're coming on to this topic of NFTs and uh, We've heard about such complex issues this morning. Um, I'm going to keep things relatively simple and high level in the 15 minutes, no, slightly less than 15 minutes that I have got to talk about this topic. Um, some of you, many of you may recognise this image. It is called Every Day for the First 5,000 Days, and it was sold by Christie's um, in... Uh, March of 2021 for the eye-watering sum of $69 million. And this event really marked the explosion of NFTs onto the digital art market. And they've rarely been out of news ever since. There's so much that could be said about NFTs from a legal perspective. Um, so I have to know where to start in 15 minutes, but I'm going to focus on the impact that they have on the digital arts market, um, coming on to think about how the UK government and um, regulatory authorities have responded to that. So NFTs are non-fungible tokens. I'm sure you've probably all heard lots of uh, attempts to define NFTs. I'm just going to do that very, very simply. They stand, of course, for non-fungible tokens. Um, so the token itself is simply a line of code, a line of computer code, that's all it is. And it generally links to or points to another underlying asset. Now that asset could be a physical work, say a, a sculpture or a painting, 
but more commonly and probably the archetypal NFT we think about links to a piece of digital art. But when we talk about the NFT, we also have to bear in mind that we're talking about the token, not the underlying <laughs> asset. So that's the token. What's this non-fungibility all about? Well, all that really means is that uh, that token is unique. There is only one such line of code. So it's not fungible or exchangeable, that's all that really means, for another line of code. And that quality distinguishes an NFT from a unit of cryptocurrency. And I compare the two because NFTs arose out of the very same technology. Um, but if I give you one Bitcoin, then I'm very happy for you to give me one Bitcoin in exchange. They mean the same thing, they hold the same value. Whereas if I give you my Rembrandt, let's say, I'm probably not that happy if you try to give me an exchange, the little doodle of flowers that you've done while waiting for the seminar to start. So that's, that's, that's that quality of uniqueness which NFTs have. And it is indeed that quality which made them very attractive for digital artists. Digital artists often found it very difficult prior to the onset of NFTs to um, make a business for themselves, to market their goods, because once you've put a digital image out there on the internet, people can copy it, replicate it. It's very hard to control that. Um, but the NFT, when you attach an NFT to that work, it imbues it with this uh, scarcity, this rarity that makes it attractive to people. They want to be the only owner of something which attaches to that particular asset. Um, another reason why NFTs were, were particularly attractive to digital artists was because they gave those artists a direct route to market. They could sell directly to buyers. And so they could make that direct connection. They could build up their own communities of interest. They didn't have to go through those middlemen, those intermediaries that are so familiar to the traditional art world and are often the parties, stakeholders that are making all the money as markets rise, often to the detriment of the artists themselves. So digital artists would then have that element of control over their own market, their own business. And the third, probably most of the tangible advantage of NFTs for digital artists was the ability to build into their sales contracts an automatic resale royalty. So just, I'm going to backtrack very briefly. NFTs are generally sold on the blockchain through smart contracts. And those smart contracts can be encoded with a number of different rules. And one of those rules might be that every time that NFT is sold, the uh, uh, a percentage of that sales is being automatically remitted back to the artist. So that was a real advantage and something that was very attractive to this artist. It's not perfect, that, um, that resale royalty. Um, one of the major glitches at the moment is that it doesn't necessarily operate across platforms. So if you mint your NFT on one platform, it then goes off chain and it's sold on another platform, that automatic resale royalty probably doesn't work in most instances. Although there may be technological solutions to that in time. Um, another benefit of um, blockchain technology for the sale of works of art, which has been much discussed, is this notion of security of provenance. So provenance by which I mean the ability to trace the chain of ownership from the current possessor back to the creator of the work, ideally. That is a really important feature in most art sales. It's what gives the work its value, its marketability. But there are real challenges in the traditional art world uh, of, you know, that whole process. The blockchain creates these immutable real-time records of every transaction carried out on it. So people said, well, that's brilliant. We can then get, you know, this, this um, completely sort of watertight problems. Certainly when we're talking about newly created works of digital art, which are immediately minted onto a blockchain, great, going forwards, we do have those records. If we're thinking about using NFTs as a way of certifying existing works of art, then I think there are some 
challenge and we have to sort of I think we have to think about this notion of security of problems with a note of caution for a couple of reasons firstly um the information on a blockchain is only as good as the data inputted into it so if there are problems with that the fact that that record is then replicated across a whole network of computers becomes immutable it's transparent it doesn't cure that uh, original problem transparency is often something which um you know is, is spoken of as a real advantage of the blockchain and again there are certainly uh, benefits however we can we can look at a blockchain and we can see transactions going from one wallet to another, but we don't necessarily know who lies behind those those wallets. So that transparency only goes um, a certain way. So very briefly, then I'm just going to whip through these because I've only probably got five minutes maximum left. Thinking about so we looked at some of the benefits. What are the risks then um, of NFTs? And there are very very many. And as I said. The NFTs have been in and out of the press week in, week out, usually uh, relating to some problematic story. Um, so, uh, oh, sorry, you, you can't see the vertical risks there, hidden under that. Um, the first is copyright infringements. Um, so I think a lot, a lot of the problems in the copyright sphere have arisen from either fundamental misunderstandings about some of the basic tenets of copyright law or just sort of blatant disregard for them and a bit of a maybe misalignment between um, the fast moving tech world and the traditional world of copyright law. So copyright questions really arise at every stage of the NFT lifecycle, but um, I'm just going to focus on two key areas. So firstly, when I mint a work, when I create an NFT from a work, I can only do that if I have the right to do so. And I will only have the right to do so if I own the copyright or if I have some sort of a license which allows me to do that. Um, and problems have a reason where people have minted uh, NFTs using um, as the underlying digital artwork a work that they've just plucked off the internet in which they have no rights. The second stage where copyright issues have arisen um, is on the sale of such works when buyers have, perhaps you might think not unreasonably, thought, well, I paid how many million dollars for this NFT. Surely I own everything about that underlying work and I can do whatever I want. I can print it on T-shirts and go and sell it down the market. Well, almost always, copyright in that underlying work will remain with the creator and all the buyer of the NFT of that work will get is um, a very limited license to do certain things maybe just to display it on their screen um, for, for personal non-commercial uses um, so there have been quite a few examples where uh, we can see those sort of fundamental misunderstandings about copyright law with one example where a group got together and purchased the print of a fancy work, and then they proceeded to torch it, to burn it, and to take a video of them burning it, um, in order that, in their words, they could transfer the entire value of this piece into the digital work they recorded without any thought of any potential copyright that Banksy might have had. Whether he would ever do anything about that, of course, is a completely different question. Um, there was another interesting example where um, somebody tried to sell an NFT of a Basquiat mm -hmm. um, print. Um, and they said that they were selling it along with all copyright and intellectual property rights, when in fact, the copyright in the, that print was owned by the Basquiat estate, which objected, and then the sale had to be withdrawn. So loads and loads of similar kind of examples of those confusions. The next area, which I'm not going to look at in any detail, so I think Maxim is probably going to touch on these things later, um, is trademark um, issues, trademark infringement. So the, the question there really is, if I own a trademark in physical goods, does that give me the right to stop people using that trademark in the NFT space for whatever reason? And Probably the most famous case, one involving the um, high-end fashion giants Hermes and their Birkin bags. And at the moment, it's looking like the brand owners um, are being favoured um, by, by the courts, but we'll see. Um, 
Okay, commercial risk. We, we touched a little bit earlier on um, on issues of sort of consumer law, and these are popping up in the NFT space. There have been a number of cases where um, there seems to be consumer confusion about the, the particular terms on which NFTs are bought and traded. They're normally bought on these NFT platforms. You've probably heard of OpenSea, Nifty <laughs> Gateway, there are many of these, and they operate in accordance with their own terms and conditions. They're not always clear to consumers, so issues are rising there. Um, risks of illicit activity. There are so many examples of various kinds of illicit activity. So straight thefts from um, customer wallets, uh, fraudulent activity where people are minting works to which they don't have any rights. Um, issues like there's something called a rug pull where an NFT is created, then the link between that NFT and the underlying work is broken such that the NFT is completely worthless. Um, then there are what we might call sort of market offences. Um, so inside a dealing, um, an employee of one of the big platforms OpenSea was convicted in the US. Um, he basically profited something like fifty-seven thousand um, dollars um, by sort of using confidential information that he got from his employment. Um, and then something to the wash trading is quite common, where NFTs are sold from one customer wallet to another customer wallet where those wallets are owned by the same person. Um, so that might be to try to artificially inflate the price, or it might be to um, conceal um, money which has come from illicit sources, which brings me on to the next risk, so money laundering. Um, the Conventional art trade has been subject to anti-money uh, laundering regulations for a couple of years now, um, but at the moment they do not clearly, so those, those regulations mean that um, art traders over a certain level in certain circumstances have to carry out quite stringent checks on their customers, so they have to know who the customers are, where the money's coming from. Uh, those kinds of rules don't at the moment apply um, to the NFT space. Um, data, data protection and privacy, there are loads of complex issues there about how um, data protection rules and the way they operate align or, or don't align very well with the way that blockchain operates, um, often in a kind of pseudonymous or anonymous way. Um, tax and estates planning, how are rules about uh, tax in the real world going to apply in the digital world? Massive environmental issues. Um, so the way in which uh, certain blockchains um, operate um, and the way in which NFT transactions um, work uses huge amounts of computational power. So there's a huge uh, carbon footprint. There are moves to, to, to improve upon that situation. And I think things are going in the right direction, but still, still an issue. So very briefly then, what has been the response in the UK? Well, I could best describe it as a pretty light touch approach. So the UK government and authorities have chosen only to extend the strong arm of the law to areas where they think there is the greatest amount of risk. Mm -hmm. And NFTs have been sort of slightly left out in the cold, the focus has been very much on cryptocurrencies. Um, so um, I think one of the reasons why that has been the case is because the within the beauty of the common law system, um, the UK courts have already shown themselves willing and able to apply existing laws to the new technology. So um, I've cited a couple of cases there um, where that has been the case. So the first one, um, interestingly, so we've been discussing the notion of crypto assets as property for a lot of today. And that uh, Osborne case was um, one where it was thought to be quite groundbreaking at the time. Um, because the court decided that there was an arguable case that NFTs could be treated as property, a matter of law. And the Tudor case I mentioned earlier, that is all really interesting, all about whether um, the developers of Bitcoin networks might owe certain duties in the nature of fiduciary duties towards uh, Bitcoin owners. And that 
that could have quite fundamental impacts, I think that's uh, going through the course of minds. So looking to the future, then things are moving towards more regulation, I would say, undoubtedly. Um, how that actually plays out will depend on a number of factors, including the development of technology itself, new use cases becoming on board for NFTs all the time. Um, and I think it will also depend on and should depend on international conversations because as it's quite clear, as we've said several times today, um, NFT trading and all sorts of trading in crypto assets and digital assets more broadly knows no territorial boundaries. So without a doubt, it's an area that the UK government is interested in um, and is watching quite carefully. Um, and we'll see what happens and, and what they decide to do over the coming months and years. Thank you very much. <laughs> Let me introduce myself again. My name is Paul Hickinson. I'm a doctor of law. Uh, um, my main specialization is IP rights, uh, intellectual property, IP and innovation. As well, I have been dealing with the topic of digitalization and its impact on legal relations for a long time. For me, NFT is not only an object of research, but something that I work with practically uh, in the startup we are which we launched uh, to make the market for digital art and collectibles legal and transparency, uh, but without burdening uh, it with uh, excessive regulation. In 2021, uh, okay. Yeah. Oh, yeah. In 2021, my article was published on Medium which describes the dangers of uh, inflated assets uh, and the real risk of uh, an uh, unregulated NFT market. Uh, then this article was read by a lot of people. It was even referred to be uh, to uh, by the chief uh, columnist of Forbes, a specialist in the field of uh, digital art and the founder of the main digital art fair in the world, Kadal Milamedevili. Um, then I managed to make a simple prediction of uh, what might happen as a result of this hype. I also predicted the emergence in the near future of conflict on the basis of uh, unauthorized sales for this NFT and other problems associated with the lack of linkage of NFT to copyright and other intellectual property rights. Uh, and indeed, the hype uh, was quickly replaced by a crypto winter. There was a sharp collapse of the market, and we uh, observed the rejection of investors from this topic, unfortunately. Uh, uh, so, as the lost youths rained down from cornucopia, the APG was uh, a class action lost youth uh, in the federal uh, central district court in California, which was uh, filed in December 22 by two NFT collectors, Adonis Real and Madame Teacher, alleging uh, that the Yuga Labs, one of the main actors of the market, creators of Bored uh, Monkeys, paid uh, celebrities to create an artificial hype around the NFT. Among the 37 uh, defendants named uh, in the lawsuits were Madonna, Justin Bieber, Serena Williams, Jimmy Fallon, uh, Michael Winkelmann, uh, uh, well known as people, uh, and many other celebrities. The plaintiffs uh, sought the measures uh, for anyone who suffered financial losses by purchasing a Yuga Lab. Uh, Yuga uh, NFTs or uh, Yuga cryptocurrency at point effective uh, April uh, 23, 20, uh, 2021. Uh, of course, this story is not about bad NFTs, but about the carelessness of the main market players. As I, I think, in fact, for a long time, everyone was satisfied that the NFT sphere remained in the shadows. Uh, and objects uh, that were not backed by real assets were circulated on the market. However, thanks uh, to lost youth and high um, profile uh, uh, court hearings, the position of lawyers began to take sharp uh, shape uh, regarding that NFT is, is 
uh, on this um, uh, on this um, slide. Uh, uh, yes, the next one we have um, uh, several uh, definitions um, from the legal point. The first from the judgment of uh, uh, Erme against the Rochel. Uh, the second one is from uh, European uh, Intellectual Property Office. So it uh, looks like official definition from institution. Um, the 12th edition of, uh, of the NICE classification uh, will incorporate the term downloadable digital files authenticated by non-functional tokens in class nine. Uh, and if these are treated as a unique digital certificate registered in, uh, in a blockchain, which uh, authenticate digital items, but are um, distinct from those digital items. For the office, the term non-fungible tokens on its own is not acceptable. The type of digital items authenticated by the NFT must be specified. Uh, a similar position is taken by U.S. Patent and Trademark, Trademark Office, which state that NFTs are maintained on a blockchain and typically represent digital assets. Um, so we uh, understand that um, NFT certificate, certificate and NFT object is like separate uh, kind of ownership. Um, Mandatory elements of NFT, according to the ERC, uh, ERC 721 standard, are unique number token ID and the address of the smart contract, contract address. The combination is these elements make uh, NFT uh, unique, but the legal concept is such that, the, uh, that we consider not only um, the technical components of NFT, ID token and smart contract, but we also, but also the content that is inside because it is uh, the important for us from a legal point of view. But what, uh, let's figure out the, um, what uh, specific content can be part of the NFT. There are three types of digital content. Yes, uh, when, uh, first one, when there, uh, uh, when there is a material physical object that is tokenized, in this case, information about this work is placed in the NFT. The second one, uh, tokens uh, that directly include a digital art object, these are independent works on the blockchain, um, like uh, on-chain on works, uh, crypto art, um, which uh, so far cannot be faked. Uh, and the third one, it's uh, non-fungible tokens containing uh, only links to an information resource that uh, holds the digital art object is the, uh, the most um, uh, useful kind of NFT. Um, such a work may be in the real world or the results of the author's activities carried out in, in their cyberspace. In this case, the non-fungible token contains only the URL uh, link that uh, points to the location of the digital object uh, perhaps the, uh, the greatest number of legal issues arise in uh, relation to the uh, last group of uh, name token and um, all the all kinds of problems also. Uh, the example of the first type of NFT is the work of Banksy, yes, which was born. Uh, the burned work of the artist Moron White, uh, which um, the blockchain company injected protocol bought from, uh, from the Tagliatella Gallery in New York for $95,000, was um, converted in, into an NFT token. After burning, the printed, uh, the, uh, the blockchain company created a non-fungible token tied to a digital image uh, of the art object. This is the known case of turning physical exciting work into a virtual, virtual asset. An example um, of the second uh, kind of NFT is crypto fund, crypto cats, and board monkeys as, as example. I mean, unchain, unchain works. And third case is the most, most in common. 
so uh, NFT identifies the digital object file. At the same time, NFT is different from the uh, digital object file. This is the NFT and the digital object file are different objects. Both objects, NFT and digital object, uh, like a file, are objects of ownership. Uh, since uh, the NFT identifies the digital uh, object file itself, the person created to uh, uh, created the NFT must be the owner of the digital object uh, for the creation of the NFT in the, uh, to be uh, legitimate, as um, uh, Emily said before. For the owner of digital object, um, the NFT that identifies this digital object is a certain shell in which the digital object is played. At the same time, such as the shell is uh, reversible. Um, so the allegations of NFTs as shell uh, also leads to the allegation of the digital object file placed in this shell. Um, Uh, yes, uh, so um, in a digital object file identified by NFTs, information about the work can be encoded in the form of ones and zeros. The work uh, is the copyright object, uh, uh, I mean artwork. It should be uh, understood that uh, the allegation of the digital object file will be not lead to transfer of property rights to a work, to the uh, to a artwork information about uh, which is encoded in the form of ones and zeros in such a digital object uh, uh, like a file. To obtain property rights to a work is not enough to transfer ownership uh, for the digital objects in which the work is uh, embodied. It is necessary to con uh, to conclude a separate agreement. Uh, given the use of the work information about which is encoded in a digital object file when uh, created, uh, creating an NFT, the person creating the NFT must be uh, must have uh, either uh, exclusive property copyrights to the artwork uh, or a license to use this work uh, in the ne necessary way. Uh, we addressed this issue. When creating, when we uh, created a, a protocol for managing intellectual property rights for NFT in VR, um, uh, I want to say um, right away that uh, this is uh, this process we were supported by Meta Company and uh, a number of well-known brands uh, that are the part of the uh, L'Oreal Group. We understand that uh, a verbal expression of the rights uh, um, to the NFT object should be uh, sewn into the token in order to give the NFT certificate a legal meaning and also create a system of secondary tokens or rather uh, tokenized licenses uh, with intellectual property rights uh, listed there, which will give the owner um, of the NFT, a real opportunity to control and manage their assets uh, and rights to it. The system of licenses is um, uh, intended for various types of commercial use of the NFT object for various purposes. A demonstration for uh, of art objects uh, like uh, like virtual exhibition, creation of secondary works uh, through. Uh, uh, like um, uh, adopted uh, works, uh, um, um, uh, what we named uh, like appropriation artworks, a uh, sale for sale for collections uh, for uh, production, uh, some kind of merch and advertising also. Uh, the protocol, protocol uh, allows um, you to manage your NFT or rather an, an intellectual property object identified by means of NFT from your personal account. Um, now we are in the process of uh, practical implementation of our protocol. It's not a simple uh, process and work as a testing laboratory ordering uh, a tool to brand this tool, this tool, I mean, 
um, uh, to brand, um, for, to give them possibility to manage IP rights um, through their own accounts, um, consists with uh, NFTs or for NFTs to make this process of transfer NFT transfer more uh, legal and transparent. Um, yes, because now we are still waiting for some for some special regulation. Yes, and I think that the thing that it is a great barrier for developing this market now. In I mean in business sphere. So thank you very much for for attention. We have two participants, uh, Gaetana Dimita, uh, senior lecturer in intellectual property law at the uh, Center of uh, Commercial Law Studies in Pillsbury University, and also Michaela McDonald, lecturer at the School of Electronic Engineer and Computer yeah. Science in Queens Mary University as well. So thank you very much for, for your participation. Thank, thank you. you. Um, so we have a joint presentation with Gaetano. I'll start. He will uh, he will finish. Um, I'm going to take this opportunity to draw on something that uh, some of the points that uh, that have been made uh, today, um, because I have the benefit of hearing other uh, other speakers uh, make their conclusions and sort of build it into uh, what we are trying to uh, we are trying to say or argue. Um, I think uh, some of the some of the themes that emerged uh, today uh, have been uh, obviously around uh, the main objective of a property system. Why do we have property in the first place? Uh, specifically to uh, enable us to convert valuable resources in whatever shape form they exist into whatever other type of resource we want to convert them into. But that is the fundamental principle of a property system, any kind of property system, private property, communal property, intellectual property. That is why we have these uh, rights and responsibilities um, in place. Uh, now, the issue is that um, in the digital world, that system doesn't necessarily match on to our expectations of what we would assume that the rules um, are going to be. Uh, we talked about the object of property, the characteristics of property. One of the uh, main um, aspects that I'd like to highlight is the notion of control. So in a lack of physical possession, we at least expect to have some sort of control, even though it is a legal fiction. Now, this aspect, if you think about it, our, uh, about our digital existence, about all the different types of digital interactions. This really is not the case. We do not have control. We might have an illusion of control. So from, um, from being the owners, we are becoming owned, not just the assets, but ourselves. This obviously has a number of different implications in terms of users' agency, privacy, etc. but is specifically evident uh, in respect of the lack, the absence of any kind of rights through which we can exercise control over our digital assets, including our accounts, including our digital identities. Now, um, thinking about expectations, uh, as I mentioned, there is uh, a principle of, um, of equivalence and equal treatment enshrined in, uh, in the law, which we can uh, think about extending to precisely this um, treatment, different treatment of physical assets and digital assets. How is it possible that, as they said, if it feels like a duck, if it looks like a duck, if it behaves like a duck, well, then surely it should be a duck. If your interactions in the digital environment mirror interactions from the real world through which you acquire property rights in the underlying assets, why the outcome in the digital environment isn't the same? So looking at a sort of the underlying technological and functional equivalence, if I am handling or treating or interacting with physical assets and digital assets, and those circumstances are identical, why is the outcome not the same? What is the justification? 
Um, one of the things that I think haven't been really mentioned enough today is why are we talking about digital assets? Why are we interested? Why does it matter that we do not control slash own anything really in digital environments? Now, very briefly, uh, there's been a number of situations, incidents, uh, news reports uh, emerging over the years uh, that highlight the lack of remedies, something also mentioned today. Uh, whether it is virtual theft, whether it is lack of inheritance, whether it is the use of um, the terms such as property, uh, buy, sell, um, ownership, etc., that again create illusions of control where such control doesn't exist. So the first is a news report of um, uh, a killing. Uh, probably a decade ago, resulting from the theft of a virtual sword, where the user uh, that was uh, impacted by the theft felt complete lack of any available remedy, and in frustration killed uh, the other player that has stolen and subsequently sold his valuable sword. Uh, this was one of the cases that really brought the discussion on virtual, ass on virtual property and digital assets into the sort of public, uh, public discourse. Uh, many of you, I'm sure, have heard of Second Life again, uh, which is experiencing a little bit of a revival, especially because it's somewhat similar or potentially one of those kind of proto metaverses. So there's the hype around the metaverse, everybody sort of remembered, oh, yes, we've had one of those already. Uh, and number of cases related to virtual property precisely on the back of the use of you own, you can sell, uh, you are the landlord, you can rent, etc. Where, again, in fact, that was not the case, because when you read the print in the license agreements, it is clear you have no rights whatsoever. Uh, more recent reports in the news surrounding Fortnite um, and uh, Tencent, the Chinese video game uh, giant, suing a platform that enables or facilitates second-hand um, sort of market for reselling digital assets, claiming, well, you can't do that because all the assets, all the virtual currency belongs to us within the game. So there is no way you can be facilitating the secondary transactions because you have no underlying rights. So these are just to highlight why we're having this conversation in the first place. Because uh, in the course of our you know, existence in the digital world, we probably don't really care. We don't read the license agreements. We don't really worry about this because we just want to be in this space. However, when situations like that arise, whether it's theft, whether it is um, a case of divorce, where you're trying to divide your digital assets as well as the physical ones, in case of inheritance, uh, and so on, you realize what the law actually says and that is the core of the issue what the law says is very different from what actually takes place and what your expectations are this multiplicity of different norms which may not necessarily be aligned the fact that i can transfer a digital asset in the uh, environment but that the license agreement says this does not confer any rights the IP law system says, well, you didn't have any rights in the first place because this does not concern, say, copyright or trademark, and there is no property right in, uh, in the asset in the first place. So we have this, this gap, this mismatch between reality and the law and the different types of norms that govern our behavior online. And there are a number of issues uh, that uh, this uh, is evident in. Uh, fact that we do not have digital exhaustion, uh, fact that there is uh, a fundamental difference between sale, what constitutes sale and license, acquiring or granting a license, especially with, in relation to, uh, to digital assets. Uh, the fact that as we found out and established today, we do not have property rights uh, in, uh, in digital assets and the whole role or the way that we have uh, 
been using license agreements as a mechanism to govern and um, allocate rights in digital environments in general. This is the moment I'm going to hand over to that. Oh, no, this one's mine too, but you can take this one. I mean, we can skip it. Again. We're on the way. Yes, skip it. No, because the, the, the crucial point is that uh, we've been constantly told in the last 20 years that there was a technological solution to the problem. I don't know if you remember DRM, TPM, There's even involved in 1996 international agreement to legally protect a piece of technology. While on the other side, and I was part of that community for a long time, there was this concept that the code was law. But we keep being reminded that when then the code failed, the law still had to intervene. Because if we don't have a proper legal framework, the fact that something is so technological is not really helping us. Probably the best example, I don't know if someone cited it this morning, was the, the DAO, the Centralized Automated Autonomous System failing uh, a couple of years ago. And then you had to go back and change the rule of the code. Because yes, the, the code is really difficult to change, but if then the code failed, what, you, what the human wants to do with the code, you have to change the code. And you need sometimes, or an agreement in a decentralized system, or the law to intervene. And so when it comes to NFT and when it comes to the use of blockchain, we go back to the fundamental question. And, and me, me and Michael have been like two, five years old, constantly asking why, and going back on, at the fourth and the fifth, why, why are we doing it? And at some point, we, we were really wondering why, why the NFT hype? Instead of you know, discussing the concepts, the legal, because especially coming from an IP law perspective, NFT and copyright law have nothing to do with each other unless you don't force them together. And if you force them together, it's something that you do consciously. It's not that it happened or that technology caused the problem. And beyond the first question, a lot of people were all trying to answer, why NFT? So what is the problem they were trying to solve? We started looking at what was the value of this NFT? Because of course, I mean, that is a quote that I stole from GDC, that is a waste of electricity. That's the best definition of an NFT. But I would like to go a little bit deeper to this, this simple job. Because of course, I mean, it is a system based on blockchain, it involves a marketplace. Actually, we've been proven now that uh, the way to make money is actually owning the marketplace. This is the only way you're actually gonna make money on NFTs. But is it creating some value? beyond, and that's why we're using these two separate case studies, beyond actually monetizing your, your, your community. Basically, if you're an NFT beyond the discussion on, on property, what you're doing, you're trying to get extra value from an existing community. That's why a lot of NFT projects fail because you don't create a community of NFTs if you don't have a community already. At that point, you're trying to maximize like selling t-shirt as a concept, just like the futuristic technological version of increasing the return. And NFTs, and I don't know if Emily still agrees with me or she changed her mind, NFT has been very valuable to the market, for, to, to, to the art market. Probably, and this is something that we will hopefully prove in some way with some bigger elements, because in, in, in the market for art, in the art world, actually, property, especially when you're thinking about more modern form of art, is not actually the key. The key is connected to the authenticity of what you have and someone else does it, basically. So the entire fact that you, are, you were happy to spend half a million pounds for a piece of paper saying, yes, it was me that made this pile of M&Ms in the corner of your room, the digital equivalent, the strong digital equivalent is the NFTs. So beyond the IP license, the copyright license, the issue of potential infringement, the value of the NFTs is that I have it and you don't, basically. And more importantly, that you don't have it. That becomes even more visible in the digital world. So NFTs, we do believe they do have a place as a very strong digital version of a certificate of authenticity. That if you if you think about it, because I still don't know what a certificate of authenticity is in legal term on top of a declaration. I mean, we need more articles being written on that too. But basically, its value is recognized by the community. Outside of the community, they have no value. It is a piece of paper. I prefer the pile of MMS. 
In video games, we're noticing something different because you wouldn't speak, you would imagine the video games that are like at the forefront of technology. They are the first user of all the technology. Most of the time are the things that actually make technology available and, and familiar to the wider population. There has been a very quick attempt and then it was dropped immediately by all the major publishers. And all the crypto games, they fail badly. Because uh, at the end of the day, in order to monetize a community in the video game world, you have to make a video game that people want to play. Mm -hmm. And no one wants to play to earn money. If you eventually earn money playing, that's another story. But the object of the game, the fun part of the game, cannot be make money. Otherwise, it's not a video game. <laughs> it, it, it loses the purpose. However, there is an incredible market, and, and the numbers are, are shocking, of how much players value items within a game. They create incredible markets that also create secondary markets, infringement, money laundering, because of course there is a massive investment of that without the need of property rights. Even in situation in which not the publisher, not the user in the long term would need property rights. I mean, in 40 years, I don't need to have the skin of my Fortnite one uh, character. I mean, it would be absurd to think that I need an exclusive right on something that is part of a video game that probably has been discontinued for 35 years. So even the, the, the theorization of property rights within a video game for the assets, on top of strong consumer protection, which, however, has been failing us for the advent of the digital world, because it always takes much longer for consumer protection law to, to catch up. Is something, everything that you would like to achieve through blockchain and NFTs in these two places has already been achieved or could be achieved without the use of the technology. Raising the question, why we're spending, again, <laughs> the why, why we, we keep going back to NFTs. It is an amazing technology. Blockchain is an amazing technology, but probably we're still experiencing how to use it without really understanding yet what the proper use of the technology is. Probably blockchain is better for identification. And, 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 and yes, <laughs> exactly. Still, however, the, the answer, the question needs to be asked. Do we need some other legal instrument to protect our interest, our agency, our control on digital assets? And the answer is yes, because, and in that I will abandon the artwork for a moment, because of course there are much less uh, corporation <laughs> involved, and we always look at the artists. But in the digital world, and video games is a perfect example, everything now is dealt contractually. Everything is dealt contractually and behind the scene, everything is dealt business to business contractually. And in these uh, scenarios, business to business contract and, uh, and, and, and business to consumer through and user license agreement and terrible services, uh, there is no guarantee that any, any of our rights will be recognized. And there are already examples of cases that are less quoted. For instance, consumer protection law in Germany stating that in an end user license agreement, the only consumer part is the part that deals with the acquisition of the, of the software and the acquisition through microtransaction. However, it doesn't apply if it's something that is within the game. And this within the game, this is within the community, with the evolution, because I don't want to call it metaverse, but I don't know how else to, to say it. With the evolution and gamification of online environment, everything is going to be a game. Us doing the shopping is going to be in a gamified environment. And if we don't find a way to guarantee our agency and freedom on, uh, online, we are, we are going to still suffer even more from this platform hege hegemony on, that controls every aspect of our life. So I know it sounds silly when we talk about someone killing another person because they stole a sword, but the bottom line is the same. The moment in which your rights are not cannot be guaranteed online, then you have to have a rethinking of the system per se. Do we have the last slide? Or, or, yes, yeah. And, and, and here was the vice but I was afraid of the, of the follow us live potential solution that we wisely decide not to include yet. <laughs> to this presentation. <laughs> it's, a, it's a very interesting point, and I think that we have 
uh, so many uh, issues to discuss, but we will return in the last five part of, uh, of our panel when we, we will have a Q and A session. Uh, so now uh, let me introduce the next uh, member of our panel, Maxim Popov, partner uh, at Mentors Law Firm. My colleague from Ukraine, Maxim Popov, specializing in uh, intellectual property law. He is recognized as a leading IP lawyer and is um, accredited uh, with uh, developing fashion law in Ukraine. His expert opinions have uh, been uh, featured uh, in uh, renowned, uh, renowned publications like uh, the Fashion Law. A law of 350 and Forbes. Additionally, Mr. Popov served uh, as the lecturer in intellectual property in, at the Ukraine State University, named after uh, Mikhail Dogomanov. He is a guest lecturer uh, at the prestigious institution, including the Zarashchenko National University of Kiev, ELT, uh, National Bar Association, Hard School and uh, the Ukrainian National Office for Intellectual Property. With his uh, uh, extensive experience, he contributes significantly uh, to the digital and IT law field. Uh, so, uh, Maxim? Uh, hi, Olga. Uh, thank you for uh, such- Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you too. Uh, thanks for such introduction and also for, for the invitation. Now I'll start to share my screen. So, uh, is it okay? Yeah. Yeah. Just go. So, first of mm -hmm. all, I appreciate for having the ability to partake in this conference, even though it's a uh, kind of remote participation. <clears throat> uh, sadly, there is a war in my country started by and provoked Russian aggression, but. Among these challenging times, Ukraine continues to fight and carry on with its own legal affair. And it's good to see that the Ukrainian IP office does not stop registering trademarks and patents. Uh, courts are handled with cases. Ukrainian lawyers keep on being a part of the legal community and keep up with the latest trends. So I'm happy to be here to share my views on intellectual property in the virtual world and bound some of ideas with you. Because, you know, metaverse, NFTs and AI, it's a real wild west. And due to the lack of, of, uh, of the regulations, and this conference has brought to light many issues related to the new and other and unexplored. So let's dive deeper uh, into my topic related to the challenges that NFT and virtual and uh, virtual assets presents. Lawyer from various country are debating some questions like how to apply for trademark registration for virtual goods and what is appropriate. Uh, uh, what is appropriate the jurisdiction for such registration? How do IP office now consider trademark use in the virtual world? How to properly license trademark and what is considered infringement and also how to deal with it? So in fact, there are a lot of questions and I take solace in knowing that I'm not the only one grappling with them. Uh, that, uh, However, today I will focus just on two specific dilemmas that have caught my attention. And the first is trademark classes for wheelchair goods. And the second is counterfeit NFT. So how to destroy something that can be destroyed. So we, we all know that trademark have classes. And uh, one of the first questions that brand ask uh, is, is the trademark registration for physical product enough to protect a similar wheelchair product? And Let's take a look at the opinion of the Ukrainian IP office. Uh, we recently had a client who wanted a trademark for wheelchair clothing and footwear, and we uh, received an interesting response, which I will gladly, uh, which I will, I will gladly translate to you. So the Ukrainian office stated that virtual it's uh, something unreal. That is virtual. It's something that does not really exist in. And virtual clothes and shoes, it's just uh, software that draw clothes on characters. As a, a result, they recommend registering virtual clothing in footwear 
under class 9. In fact, the, the office also provides specific wording for the virtual closing application. It's such a downloadable computer software for producing simulated closing, footwear and headwear, including on characters or downloadable files containing image of closing, footwear, headwear for use in, in uh, a virtual en environment. So in short, the Ukrainian office assumes that registering a trademark for a physical product is not enough. And uh, commonly, other office has a similar opinion. The USPTO and the UA IPO also advise filling application for virtual closing under class nine. Uh, however, we may consider the mark under class 42 if these are not downloadable objects. And uh, as I know, the UK IPO has a similar uh, viewpoint, but at the same time, when a company uses a wheelchair NFT, they advise uh, when a company uses the virtual NFT that certifies the authenticity of for real clauses, uh, it can be in usual class 25. So we have three potential classes when we seek in, uh, when we seek in protection for virtual closing. It's uh, 9, 25, and 42, where 9 and 42 are the main ones. But my question is, is it logical? Because as I said before, we all know that trademark have classes, but but uh, uh, consumers don't know about it. In fact, most consumers don't even realize that trademarks are categorized into whopping 45 classes. And let's be honest, sometimes when a new product comes out, we don't know which class we should classify it in. And sometimes understanding the logic behind the classes can be also quite a challenge at time, even for us. Uh, for instance, uh, let's uh, uh, look at uh, class nine. We have the photo and video devices, uh, eyeglasses, smart watches, uh, cases, software, and diving suits, and laboratory clothing, and now virtual clothing. But Let's get back to our consumers and let's talk about the difference that consumers uh, perceive. I think it's interesting to recall the times of the pandemic. In 2021, luxury brands massively started filling class 5 applications for medical masks to counter the use of their trademarks. But, you know, however, it's unlikely that consumers would associate mask, masks with something medical. I think they would probably see them more as some fashion accessories that comes from a certain fashion famous brand. And if we're talking about virtual goods, I think it's highly unlikely that the consumer would associate virtual clothing with another virtual product, such as a car. From the consumer's point of view, virtual clothes and the virtual cars are not the same thing. They are different in the same way as physical clothes and physical cars. So in their eyes, there are separate products that have no connection to each other. And many brands, you know, real clothing brands are present in games or metaverse as virtual clothing uh, under, under license, of course. And in my opinion, uh, also the distribution method is different between the real and virtual clothing. Consumer will associate virtual clothing with clothing because uh, it's more logical than treating virtual clothes like software that draws clothes. Of course, if we talk about trademarks and virtual goods, we must recognize the Hermes versus Rothschild case. Uh, I'm confident you all know the ruling of this landmark case, but I will just highlight the main outcome. Hermes didn't have a special trademark for NFTs, but the jury concluded that Meta Birken NFT would infringe on Hermes rights. So in fact, we can have a different opinions about this decision, but I think it's fair because, you know, it shows that courts, that, that cards do not allow third parties to use goodwill and recognition of physical goods when somebody or you know, someone creating virtual goods. And, you know, if you find the outcome of the Hermes Rothschild case and my views a bit radical or a bit revolutionary, I want to mention another case. It's not directly related to NFTs or virtual goods, but it shed lights on my topic. 
So it's, I'm talking about the case of Swatch versus Samsung. You see, uh, Samsung has an app store where people can download the watch faces for their smartwatches. Uh, Swatch legal team found about 30 faces in the store, faces from iconic brands like Tissot, Longin, Omega, Breguet, and Blankfein. Uh, perhaps they were particularly outraged by the um, drug draws tropical bird. It uh, cost uh, $650,000. And yet, anyone with smartwatch could have easily downloaded on their, uh, uh, on their uh, smartwatch. So I will not retail the entire court decision that found Samsung guilty. However, I will highlight something interesting. So UK High Court argued that smartwatches are highly similar to regular watches. And here's the logic. Both type of watches have faces, right? And uh, what do you see when you check the time on both? Yeah, it's the watch, uh, it's the watch face, of course. It's the main screen. So users who uploaded their faces to their smartwatches wanted to show others that they are wearing a kind of famous watch from famous brand. So by the, by the judge's opinion, trademarks on smartwatches should be treated in the same way as trademarks on regular watches. As for me, it sounds exciting and a bit like comparing virtual and real things, doesn't it? And uh, let's take a quick look about uh, the second part. It's uh, what to do with counterfeit virtual goods. So when brands are sued for counterfeiting, one of the lawyers claim is uh, to destroy the counterfeit because you can't allow them to sell counterfeit uh, or even give it to people for free. And if it's and ordinary goods, I mean physical goods, so we can burn it or run over by, by some road roller. And if it's, if it's ordinary virtual good uh, in the metaverse on games, we can file a claim and they will be removed. But what about NFTs? NFTs is non-fungible token by nature. Uh, it's meaning that it can be deleted or it can be it can be replaced with something other. So how to deal with it? The way I see it is to send the NFTs to what known as burning wallet. And if you don't know what is burning wallet in crypto, think of it as a special non-existent address that nobody has access to. And there are a lot of such addresses. Uh, some of them even store cryptocurrency and NFTs worth $250 million or more. And But I should clarify that burning wallet, it's not exactly like burning fake losses because it's more like locking up goods in warehouse and throwing away the key. So it's like uh, a Schrodinger's counterfeit, if you will. The disputed products still exist. Uh, but we can know about it and uh, nobody can use it, at least that the way they tell us. So we come to the end of my presentation. Now, as you see, trademark owners uh, face dilemmas protecting wheelchair goods, especially when seeking an appropriate class for trademark registration. And for now, registering a trademark solely for physical goods may not cover wheelchair parts, and while destroying counterfeit physical goods is logical, I think we need some alternative solution for counterfeit NFTs. And if you would like to continue the conversation or have any inquiries, please, please do not hesitate to reach me out. You can find my contact details on the final slide, featuring my photo, LinkedIn profile, and email address. Thank you. Thank you, Martin. Thank you very much. <laughs> Please be safe. Um, and now we are uh, in uh, the last uh, <laughs> step of from finishing today's conference. Um, the last speaker is now not online. Uh -huh. So let uh, maybe uh, start the dis the, some kind of discussion. Maybe we have uh, some uh, uh, questions from uh, online audience. No, okay. So, um, uh, 
Camila, you you check. Yes. You're in control. <laughs> yeah. Okay, thank you. Um, I have a question for um, the participants of uh, my panel. Uh, so if you uh, will um, finalize our opinion <laughs> of the NFTs, do you think the patient uh, should be treated or uh, is uh, he doomed? <laughs> so yeah, what, what the, uh, what your maybe uh, final opinion, some, some kind of conclusion? <laughs> I don't think he's entirely doomed. <laughs> um, I think I think the technology on which he is based is here for the long term. Um, whether or not NFTs will continue to be used in the way in which they have been, certainly whether they will continue to raise the kinds of prices uh, that we've seen, I think is is um, probably debatable. And I think many people would say that. I've heard somebody say actually that um, NFTs weren't a bubble as such, they're more like a bubble gun. You know, those guns that children have when you pull out lots of bubbles and then there's a bit of a gap and then some more bubbles arise. There may well be other kinds of use cases which, which are sort of more useful. We've talked about, um, you know, uses of NFTs as more like certificates of authenticity, whatever they might be, or some kind of a record. Um, so yeah, I think, and I, I but I do also think that um, already the, there are quite a lot of stakeholders who have quite a lot of skin in the game. So um, I think it's been interesting to see a bit of an evolutionary process where the NFT world and the NFT community started off as just that as a community certainly within the sort of visual arts um, of people who wanted to share their art wanted to you know build up these communities and to interact with each other on some kind of a democratized um, decentralized platform and we have already moved to quite quickly to a scenario where, as Lantana was saying, you know, all the power rests with the platforms, really. Um, and the sort of traditional uh, intermediaries of the art world have become involved, heavily involved, like the auction houses. Um, but uh, there have also been some really interesting sort of creative uses made. So, institutions that you might think are really sort of quite traditional and conservative, like museums and galleries, public institutions have made interesting use of benefits, and not just as, um, you know, sort of money-making schemes. There have been some really interesting uh, sort of explorations of what is what is behind this craze and what, motive, what has motivated people to get involved with NFT. Um, and, you know, thinking about whether they could be some sort of vehicle towards a different way of interacting with one another, you know, different sort of social and economic systems. Um, so all that's to say, I don't think they are doomed, mm -hmm. um, to go back to your, your question, um, but I think, you know, they will morph and, um, you know, the, the, the picture for NFTs and for the whole of blockchain technology might be really quite different in the sort of, you know, three, four, five years time. Um, yeah, uh, I agree and I hope so. And uh, if we uh, will speak about uh, art and video games, yes, so we need maybe the, uh, or especially metaverse and the three, we need some, uh, some, um, some specific instruments for digital role. Yes, more flexible, more fast, uh yes and you uh, said about the because the no, traditional... because we're gonna be schizophrenic <laughs> the because the traditional uh, licenses agreement are very very hard it takes so many time to manage to to deal to um teach all these kinds of conditions and these documents it keeps uh, like three months uh, uh right. usually in in business theory uh, yeah, no, it's, it's very difficult. You're right. to use it. Apparently, we really need it. But one of the things that we 
we haven't decided yes if, yet if we want to explore or not is why do we need it because of course the the more while if you ask the question is who is the patient here mm -hmm. because if, if the point is to guarantee a digital artist to to get some money out of his creation because otherwise right click uh, and they copy their work yeah. Yeah. they might lose they might have to work in a McDonald's to keep painting. I mean, that, that that's the classic example on, on, on why we protect and why we use technology to avoid digital copy. But then the, the, the further in the future you ask the question, you ask the why, you really honestly wonder whether or not it is a good idea. Because why do we have to have protection for a virtual car and spend more on a Ferrari than a Fiat Panda when it's a virtual car? Why do we have to, the moment you create a property on digital assets and people that are rich on digital assets, you automatically create people that are poor mm -hmm. with digital assets. Yeah. So what, what, what is the motivation behind of transferring the similar uh, rules and similar expectation from offline to online when we don't actually need these things online? So at the moment it's really difficult. And, 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 <laughs> But I, I have an opinion on this because I think we have a lot of laws and regulations in the real world, but also applied to digital environments as well, that work with assumptions. Assumptions that through these laws and regulations, we will meet these objectives. And we've implemented these laws and regulations and therefore objectives have been met. We don't really have um, proper evidence-based tools and mechanisms of how we can measure mm -hmm. that the objectives have actually been met. So we know that this regulatory approach or this legal mechanism is actually really effective. So we end up with having the kind of intellectual property rights that we have, the kind of copyright system that we have, be using license agreements for absolutely everything, but we don't know whether it works. We don't have any data, we don't collect data, we don't collect evidence to determine that this particular um, setup, the, the way the parameters are set up, are actually achieving what we want. If we look at copyright in general, there is no evidence saying that it actually incentivizes creativity. What is the evidence? None. It is an assumption, an assumption that we keep um you know sort of emphasizing and embedding in everything but it is not an assumption that is has been verified that this is the best possible system we can have in order to achieve the objectives which is incentivize creativity you know have a wide range of cultural goods that are available to you know the, the general public and rewarding the authors and creators and I think there are a lot of situations like that and without thinking about how we can actually determine that the way we are governing and regulating various interactions actually works, then we just keep making the same mistakes and making the same assumptions in new situations. So with NFTs, you know, of course it's not doomed, of course it's not completely, you know, absolutely pointless but i think for the purposes that we are using it it is because a lot of the time it's been put forward as a solution technological solution for the lack of control in the digital world but that's not what it is and it's not what it achieves yeah and so yet again we sort of like oh we're solving the problem but we are not yeah, okay. but um, yes, we are not, but we can we can do it. So we can uh, maybe offer some some decision how to uh, to combine uh, technical tools and the legal ones. So not to wait for some kind of regulations or new law. We can offer for community some rules, which can apply by several platforms on the market. Yes, I yeah. think. What are we doing here? Are we protecting people who have vested interest and rights in the offline world? So our tra trademark holders, our you know, people that have existing works of art in which to have copyright. And we would probably all agree that they deserve a degree of protection. We can't be political, right? We've got to uphold the current IP machine. But we would all agree that in relation to those existing rights there need to be some degree of protection 
But then, of course, there are people who create entirely new things in the digital world, which didn't exist in the offline world. I mean, when I was first, you know, on the radio and stuff, I'm not an expert, obviously, but listening to programs on NFTs, I thought in my naivety that what people are doing, they create original pieces of art, and then because of the lack of copyright protection in the digital world, they use NFTs to create this wraparound to protect their rights. Ghostly, yeah. But that's something very different to asking the question whether a already existing photographer who's been producing for the last 20 years should protect their work. So it's in my mind, there are two separate questions, right? So part of it is, I think, Michaela, what you're saying, is to the extent we have created a new world, and what role should creativity play and existing copyright to protect creativity in that new world, right? That's one question. But the other question, which is quite separate, is how do you protect offline rights or pre-existing rights in these new worlds? And to my mind, they're actually two separate things, right? Yes, but I think... Uh, yes, again, no, not too, the, the, not too separate. No, yes, but it depends what you're protecting. Because, for instance, simplifying trademarks at the end of the day you you, you want to protect a connection between uh, the producer of the goods and services and the goods and services and uh, even though trademark evolved and now there is advertising function there are a lot of other functions of trademarks so the example been mentioned before at the end of the day uh, a meta burkini if it wasn't because of an NFT, it would probably have been a parody of freedom of speech in the US. The court would have this, probably approached it very differently for this use of a trademark. This is not my bag. We, we, we have the, uh, sorry, my, my other bag is up. I don't remember the trademark. <laughs> but I mean, there have been, in the past, we were looking at these same issues very differently. Now, since there is a market, a new market to invade, pardon me i like the politicization of it mm -hmm. a lot at that point we have to ask the question if it's uh, even good for the framework system to expand because uh, again projecting the scenario why should i register a class 9 and 22 for the globe when at the end of the day i could register with azure instead of using the trademark system i just have an agreement contractual agreement with the cloud provider that whatever is metal birkini or sounds like birkini, they take it down. And at that point, we don't need trademark online anymore. You money just money shut it down. Because they make money. Depends how much you pay. But it's the same as enforcement. If you, The more you want to enforce, the more you have to invest. Oh. The more you pay Microsoft or Apple or Google, the more you achieve your result. But if we leave the platform, free to have it done business to business, our rights, our already residual rights, in some countries, I cannot even call them rights, the limitation and exception, <laughs> the limit, the, the slowly disappear. So it's, 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 it is for the survival, not for the survival of the system per se, but because the system in theory sh should balance. <laughs> we use the word balance in the last panel, should be there to balance. And, and the balance is the risk more than the technology. And, and I would also add that it very much the, the, I think the analysis will very much depend on whether you are looking at the rights of, uh, you know, from the commercial perspective or rights of the user. Because I think from commercial perspective, you know, businesses will be okay. They will adapt to the system. They will use the tools that they have. You know, they will rely on contract more. They will take uh, or make most of the available technology. From the perspective of the user, that space and the number of rights and the way you can exercise them is just going to shrink even further. Hmm. So again, you know, it, it's the answer depends on who is asking. And I also want to ask uh, the opinion of Maxime. Maxim, you are still online? Yeah, yeah, I'm here. Yeah, maybe you have some... Maxime, I, I called for your opinion. I don't know if you know this. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Uh, you know, I, maybe I'm not uh, disagree that we do not need any trademark system, as, as, as you mentioned before, because if you're talking about if you want to take down some counterfeit in fa Facebook, in Instagram or other platform, you certainly need the trademark. You you can do it without the trademark and if we're talking about nfts i think also when we will live in metaverse uh, i think we also 
needed to a trademark if we want to take down some counterfeit or to to counter some fakes. And uh, if we come back to the first uh, a question about NFTs and the future, I think uh, that NFTs will play on because you know maybe it's uh, will be like virtual uh, virtual reality or AR. Uh, it will be reinvented it and. Uh, because for me, NFT is not just a hype or a way to make money. It, it, uh, I think it's also the way to uh, certify something. You may have had about the case uh, StockX Nike, uh, where NFT used to certify it ownership of sneakers. Uh, this also is a controversial case, of course. But in my opinion, it's really the purpose of NFTs to certify something. And uh, also, if we're talking about the using NFTs in metaverse or some games, it's also it's some kind of uh, a certifier that you obtain some original thing. Thank you. Rafa, yeah. Uh, I, I see on the panelists you are sincere supporters of the. IP doctrine, it's, I understand you. Uh, I have uh, our comments and maybe two questions, if you don't mind. Good perfect, please. Yeah. Um, I presume that maybe market and uh, stakeholders uh, would be interested as in the contractual mode as about the property regime. It depends on the need, first of all, economic needs. Today we have, uh, obviously, uh, fewer economic impact because uh, NFT is more updated, more moderated types of the using of IP rights, which uh, create additional value. Um, but we haven't any legal job, just a legal uh, explanation uh, by the update in the legal regime of intellectual property. Um, I think that um, we have further um, or later to give answer in the question would we use? The, or implement the equivalent of the correlation between property ownership and intellectual property and key property. For example, under the Ukrainian civil court, we have a provision under which um, property right and intellectual property are independent. So therefore, would be presume that you, to you, would you presume that such similar rule could be implemented or under the contractual basis or maybe by future of the law? And the second one, uh, question is related to the legal status of the in game items. We think uh, we create the legal grounds for the, for the purchasing of such, such features, creations, because it's a problem. We don't have any possibility to justify the purchasing. Sailing of such uh, actual objects. It's very interesting to hear. I'm sorry, we can return to this uh, uh, question maybe after uh, the last uh, uh, speech. Yeah, yes, because now I see Jean Marc Del Toro uh, uh, online. Uh, let me introduce uh, the uh, last speaker. Of our panel, Jean Marc Del Torn, adjunct director of STAPIS, it's the Center of uh, Intellectual um, Property Law Studies, 
in Strasbourg University, uh, adjunct uh, director of SAFIS uh, Research Laboratory. Jean-Marc is an associate professor at the International Center of the Study of Intellectual Property in Strasbourg University and uh, adjunct director of SAFIS Research Laboratory. Uh, at SAFI, Jean-Marc studies uh, the interplay between IP norms and emerging digital technologies from AI to quantum computing. He is co-founder and director of SAFI's AI and IP University Diploma and a member of the Observatory of on Emerging Technologies from the European um, uh, Intellectual Property Office. Prior to uh, joining SAFI, uh, Jean-Marc spent more than 15 years at the European Patent Office, uh, where he led uh, the AI expert group and chaired uh, the prosecution of AI and quantum computing applications. Jean-Marc holds a, a, a PhD in theoretical physics from Paris University and a PhD in law from the University of Strasbourg. So Jean-Marc, nice to meet you, nice to hear you, <laughs> nice to see you. Please uh, uh, share your presentation. Sure. And, um, uh, yeah. So I'll share my slides. I've got a little time to uh, to talk about something quite different, maybe, from the subjects you've talked about so far, but actually you see it's quite connected. Um, let me share it first, okay, so that at least you've got an idea of what I'm talking about. I don't know if you can see the slide now. Can you? Just let me know. Uh, no, in no. this moment, not available. Oh, yeah, super. No. All right, it should come up. It's a bit long, maybe, because it's... Uh, Okay, but it's, it should be there. Okay, let's just need to change my screen as well. So I'm going to talk about AI today. Uh, why? Because it matters. I mean, you've you've heard about it, I'm sure, recently. It's been in the news. It's been everywhere. Uh, we've been talking about AI for quite a long time in reality. Uh, it's not just a novelty. It's 70 years old, almost. So you see, it's not exactly a, a new topic. Uh, but still, there are many, many uh, issues related to AI that deserve our attention at the moment. We talk about new categories of uh, um, uh, models. We talk about those foundation models. I'll come back to that later in the talk. That's the introduction. We're talking about AI. And I, AI and NFTs are strongly connected. There are actually uh, there are many, many uh, connection points between the two technologies. So even though I'm not talking about NFTs per se, uh, you see that there are reasons for me to articulate the talk about this sort of interface between uh, what I call emerging technology, emerging digital technologies, and NFTs and AI are both disruptive, potentially disruptive at least, uh, technologies that will deserve to be addressed on the IP angle. So again, apologies because I'm seems to be quite complicated on my side now the next so, slide. okay uh, where so if you go to the next slide probably you will see a pipeline what i call uh, a generation the value chain of ai i don't know if you can see it but um, my talk is going to articulate on the on the second part of this slide so this slide is actually something a storyline if you will between data and uh, the way the data is being processed by what we call AI today, which is essentially machine learning. Machine learning takes data in and transform this data in what we call a machine, mod machine learning model, an inference model, to produce uh, an application, something you can deploy in the field. So this application can take, can take new data and produce a prediction, okay? So this is es essentially the, the, the overall classical pipeline of AI applications today. And uh, they essentially rely on a, a sequence of, of um, steps. Um, so um, I don't know, technology, human one, technology, not so much. Right, so um, basically that's it. I'm gonna save a bit of time by telling you just uh, the um, the main idea of this slide is that the, the value is distributed everywhere in the in the pipeline, okay? From data to algorithm, software, to what we call machine learning models. So for example, the foundation model, the model under ChatGPT, for example, and the application, and also the output, the data has a lot of value, of course. But value is uh, is across all that value chain, and that's of, so part of the challenge of protecting AI as such. It would be the same for NFTs, by the way. NFT are software, algorithm, products, content, also all of that participate in the value of that technical object. 
So the problem here is, is talking about um, the protection of that object when it's indeed a hybrid entity. It's multifaceted. It's, uh, AI is as much as code as it is training process, the algorithm, if you will, a network, a neural network architecture, training data, of course, because we talk about machine learning, learning from what? From data. A model, the foundation model, for example, the large language models behind ChatGPT, and the application, and also some hardware, because we need hardware to make it work, okay? So when we talk about AR, we talk about all that at once, which makes it quite complicated as legal scholars, because we like the definition of proper definition of objects. We like a clear perimeter around the object we want to define. Think about NFTs, same problem, okay? How to define the boundary of the value of the NFT when there is a sort of a flow of changes sometimes and, and distributed value all across the board. So if you talk about uh, IP, you need to talk about the, the, the modalities of protection of IP again, the choice there between copyright patents, sui generis database rights in Europe, trade secrecy, trademark, talk about contracts in generality and trade and designs, if you will. But there is a sort of a, a gamut of options we need to dive into in order to think about the protection of AI. I'm going to select a few, okay, not to be complete. Select a few where I think we need to have some kind of vigilance points, red lights to keep in mind that are specific to the nature of AI. And again, think about NFT. Okay, so I'm not going to underline that all the time, but it's about the parallel you, I, I want to, uh, to show. So if you take about, think about AI as software, it's been coined by very, very prominent figures in the field of AI, like Andrei Karpati, uh, former chief engineer of Tesla, now back at OpenAI. And Andrei Karpati coined the term software 2.0 to qualify that AI is indeed a form of software. How is software protected in Europe and pretty much everywhere in the world? Like a piece of literature which means that what is being protected, uh, I just quote here the directive uh, in, in the European directive, is essentially the expression of the code. So what you have on the left-hand side, uh, the way the legible expression by human beings or it's translated form into zeros and ones that a, a computer can understand, but not the underlying concepts, the idea, the functionalities, which we really, really matter if you think about it. This is not protected by copyright at all. Okay, this is part of the realm of ideas. So we have a dichotomy between form and function. Function matters, but form is only protected by copyright. But that's not sort of the issue really with AI. Changes with AI relate more to the production of objects. And here you have example, I could have included example from ChatGPT. The illustration is about a GitHub Copilot. It's, it's pieces of code that help you code better, faster, most effectively. Every coder in the world now uses such type of codes. I use them all the time and my students too. So we use code completion code to produce new code. And the issue there related to copyright is that is a question, can the code, such a code be being produced by uh, an AI um, helper, if you will, uh, be protected by copyright? And the core idea behind this, is this code original? Uh, what's the originality be behind this code if a machine, in a sense, functionally produced it without any input from your side? And that's an issue because indeed for copyright, you need a human being at the source and some kind of intelligible default, some kind of produce of the intellect. If it's clicking on a button, is that enough? So of course, we can't really give you a sort of a a general answer. It's always on a case by case basis. You're as, as lawyers, you know that by heart. Uh, but we need to evaluate indeed the threshold of originality when there is the intermediation of such an object in the pipeline, in the value pipeline. And that's a first problem problem that actually leads to companies forbidding right away, right now, the use of such tools because they, you know, they fear in a way their copyright code may not be eligible for copyright protection, so sorry, the software, the software may not be eligible for copyright protection if indeed uh, an AI helper has been used in the pipeline. So that's one aspect I'd like to highlight with you. And the second one is the fact that also not so much talked about all the codes that are used in, in the AI field, but in, in many, many other fields are based on pieces of code that are being devised by third parties. We call them libraries, packages, modules, um, plenty of words to say the same thing. We are reusing the work of other people. What does it matter for AI is that this code is not free of use, it's under specific licenses that may be overall very permissive licenses, 
you see them here listed. Uh, Apache 2.0 is a very famous one. Uh, MIT BSD, very permissive indeed. Uh, but uh, for uh, all intent purposes, sorry, I'm going back here, uh, we also need to consider the constraints associated with such licenses. And one constraint that's not always realized is the attribution right. It's not because you've got a commercial, uh, you know, free to use uh, your, your code for commercial purposes, so for any kind of policy that, that you should, in a sense, forget about the moral right of the authors. And that's a centerpiece of uh, a case uh, uh, in the US, an important one opposing Matthew Butery, presenting a, a, a group of people against GitHub. Microsoft in reality, because of that very reason, the fact that the code is not attributing the product, the original piece is not being output by its modality I was showing you before. Um, and in fact, that's infringing on the moral rights of the authors. And that's quite fair. Another element I want to highlight with you is the fact that this is an opportunity also to think about new forms of licenses, the responsible AI licenses on the code. In fact, this is all branch, you know, in, in, the, in the field of AI, but in software as well, where we inject a sense of responsibility. And we, we, we know about that now. AI can be risky business. It can be used in so many things that we don't want in a sense uh, it to be useful, but still it's there. So how do we incorporate this sense of responsibility, this sort of constrained perimeter of uses, of later uses from the onset, from the very beginning? Well, we can use licenses. And this is indeed a fact that also being uh, developed at the moment, those RAID licenses, responsible AI licenses are another form of, in a sense, control over the code. And we should keep that in mind. A big important uh, aspect of uh, IP in the co context of uh, AI is trade secrecy. Trade secrecy, you know that in Europe is built on four building blocks. It's information, it has, uh, it's a secret, so it's very tautological, but it has commercial value to, due to the secret and you take you know, the response your your uh, take uh, steps or means for protecting it, for protecting your secrets. So that's very important. All those components create a sort of an equation for trade secrecy. And in fact, AI is oftentimes protected by trade secrets. But the issue there, and that sort of changed in the last few years, is that although trade secrecy does not protect about, uh, against uh, reverse engineering, people didn't care so much. Why? Because they felt it was so complex. This black box, you know, that's the term we, we, we use sometimes to refer to the, about the, the AI, the neural network. It's so complicated that we don't care about its reverse engineering. Nobody will be able. Well, nah, not quite. In practice, although all those aspects could be indeed, in a sense, uh, protect by trade secrecy. What about if the, you know, asking yourself, you can ask yourself if the training data is really safe? Uh, is the training process safe? And is the model, the output, for example, the one by OpenAI, ChatGPT, really safe against attacks through reverse engineering? And the idea was actually, we don't care so far, you know, a few years back, but now we realize they're not safe at all. So why? Because people have devised ways to interrogate the model and get access to all this information that we thought was hidden, hidden inside the black box, if you will. Now it's not more, no more the case. So in fact, trade secrecy used to be a sort of a, you know, a go-to solution, if you will. A cheap solution in practice, you don't have to pay for anything where well, you have to keep the secret secret. That's gonna be costly and, and, and not so easy in practice. But actually uh, it, it's not working so much, especially if your business model depends, relies, on that, those objects, the data, the architecture, or the model. You better find another, ways of, another way of protecting it than just trade secrets because reverse engineer, reverse engineering we may impair in a sense that protection. So what about patents? That could work because patents, they're not like copyright, they protect the functionality and they offer a sort of an exclusive right, not like trade secrecy. So against anybody reusing the, the functionalities of that, that object. Of course, it's under condition. We'll see that in a moment. And in, indeed, patents have been a massive, seen a massive boost in, in, uh, in uh, uh, the use of or the deployment of AI inventions. The, those curves from, from uh, uh, the EPO shows in this, showing this sort of the exponential uh, increase in the number of patent application related to that deep learning revolution. We're still into it. And not just patent application, but also grants. So, you know, a title, a real patent, a real monopoly, 
not just an intention in a sense to get a point of polyacuity, the one on the left. So the, the curve on the right shows that indeed we ground patent about AI as we do ground patents about blockchain technology all the way, not so much about NFTs, but I'll come to that reason later. So how does it work for patentability? It's very easy. I'm going to give you the recipe. If you, see, if you want a recipe for patenting, there is one. And for patenting AI application, actually, it, there it is. So first, we welcome application in all fields of technology. So very, very welcoming approach to technology. And there are conditions. We have a, a patentable object in the first place that meets certain conditions. So the patentable object is not any object. For example, pure mathematics are not patentable, but only if they are claimed as such. I'm going to give you what uh, detail of what that means. And once you identify your patentable object, you need to meet a certain number of conditions, novelty, inventive step, for example. Okay, So that's the, the gist of the idea, the overall scheme under which we all fall. All jurisdictions in the world follow the same, essentially, two steps, two hurdle approach, more or less. Okay, So what does it, what does it work uh, for the first approach? This is a neural network, but a neural network network as such is not patentable because it's a mathematical object, but it's very, very easy to create, if you will, artificially a, a patentable entity, potentially patentable. How do we do it? We merge that mathematical object, the neural network, with something material, a sensor that could be a camera or a microphone or just a computer. So that becomes, in a sense, a sort of a, a dual entity that we call a computer implemented invention. And this indeed passes the first hurdle of patentability. This is a potentially patentable object, OK? A neural network is a mathematical function, but if you connect it to a computer, suddenly it becomes potentially patentable. So it's a very, very shallow, if you will, hurdle. The real problem is the second stage. The second requirement is to address, indeed, the contribution, the algorithmic features that are individually, as such, purely mathematical. How do we consider them in the frame or of interrogating those conditions, in particular the inventive step condition, this patentability condition? And here again, I'm not going to give you all the glorious details of that um, beautiful case law uh, called Convic, but this is essentially the rule book now under which we fall in order to patent AI and blockchain and NFT. We will all follow that very case law called Convic now, that's its little name, T641000, that tells us something very, very interesting, is that you cannot discard algorithmic features just because they're, they're algorithmic. You have to look at them in context. You have to see whether they contribute to a broader, bigger purpose. So if your blockchain, for example, participates in increasing the security of a transaction as such, that security part, part is a patentable objective. And for that reason, the mathematics, the Merkel tree, for example, at the core of the any blockchain uh, technologies, not all of them, but many of those, can become, in a sense, an element that contributes to the security of the transaction and hence worth be deemed patentable, if it's not obvious, of course. So you see, that decision is very, very interesting because it helps us bridge the gap between abstraction, mathematics, and application, the fact that we use a particular kind of mathematics or algorithm for a specific purpose. So indeed, if that works, you can get a patent for AI if the application is deemed technical or for blockchain or even NFTs, OK? And that's been anchored in the very important and large Board of Appeal decision, G1 of 19 of two years ago by the, uh, by the EPO. An example here for AI is a neural network that's been used to improve the recognition of your heart fibrillation in a pacemaker. If that improves to say, if that helps to save life, why not, you know, not protecting it? It could be an invention that saves life and indeed. Not all applications are deemed patentable. Uh, natural language processing, surprisingly enough, although we talk about it quite a lot now with ChatGPT, is not something that is considered technical by the boards of appeal. It's weird. I agree. I mean, I tend to agree because I understand the reasons behind it, but it feels weird because it's so much at the center of a new technological revolution, but still for the boards in Europe in particular, but many other countries, it's con considered closer to linguistics, more like, you know, something like theoretical, not applied, than purely technical, technological. So that means that many, many applications of chat GPTs, for example, may not be considered technical and hence worth not patentable. The same for business 
method, applications of NFTs to financial transaction, that contribution to the financial transaction is not sufficient to make the NFT useful, for example. That's why so many NFTs that are related, in a sense, to that business purpose are not considered patentable. But security, improving the security of a transaction is patentable. So you see, it's the, the borderline is sometimes a bit fuzzy. And to be honest, you have to dive somewhere in the technicalities in order to find, to decipher, to decode uh, the threshold between technical and non-technical according to the boards. But essentially, there's a, we, it's a moving ground, by the way, also. It's a moving landscape. But it's something that we, we try to, um, to make evolve and, and, and get more clarity about, of course. So, I'm sorry um, that I need to uh, interrupt you, but we have um, a little bit <laughs> few time to... All right. Yeah. So I, anyway, the, the, the final... I'm concluding on this thing, actually, is the, the final point on that uh, presentation is that there are many options to protect AI as NFT. The core issue at the moment is more on the responsibility issue. And it's a very important element at the EU level because responsible innovation becomes a, an essential cornerstone of the, of the legislative process. And patents, indeed, surprisingly, such as licenses, I talked about rail licenses, can be a tool at the service of that responsible innovation. I will leave you with that, just focusing on the, don't forget <laughs> the slides. Thank you That's it. Much. So uh, a tool to promote responsible innovation and trustworthy AI or NFT, I think that's a possibility. And IP, can be an element in that conversation. So thank you very much. And apologies for all the technical problems we had in the beginning. Thank you. Thank you very much. So all the problematics looks very similar to NFT. Yes, it's true. So we need to now finish to finalize our uh, conference. Yes. So maybe the all uh, answer of uh, on your question, we will have yeah. yes the time like unfor in an informal yeah. Uh, yeah, part of event. So thank you very much for all participations of our brilliant panel. Yeah, Jean Marc. Thank you. Yeah. Keep in touch. Thank you. Thank have you. Good coming in London. <laughs>